Next person on stage is Joe McNamee. He comes from Ireland and he fights for European digital civil rights um, in the organization EDRI. It's an umbrella organization with um, now 35 members in whole Europe. And um, the title of his talk is Freedom of Speech, Nipples and the Rule of Law. And uh, he just told me this very funny story about nipples and I think he's going to tell you too. So have a nice talk with him. Joe, stage is yours. Thank you very much, I've, uh, and uh, hello to Richard Allen, uh, Facebook's chief lobbyist, who um, doubtless will have some questions when I'm finished. Um, I've just come back from holidays in the west of Ireland, where we've got a really strong accent. So if uh, anything I say makes uh, no sense, um, then feel free to wave your arms at me saying, please speak more clearly, and I will try to speak more clearly. So, um, I assume that there are relatively few people here that spend time explaining to scientists why science is important, or who spend time talking to builders explaining why buildings are important. Well, assuming this is, that this is the case, sorry. The person who set this up um, put their hand on my touch screen and um, managed to... Uh... So assuming that this is the case, you might be surprised to hear that working in a political environment, I spend an awful lot of my time explaining to lawmakers why law is important. And this is because behind the scenes, there's a major trend in European policy making and global policy making to move protection of basic elements of democracy out of the rule of law. The move is away from using international law or constitutions to protect fundamental freedoms, such as the freedom to receive and impart knowledge. Instead, the regulation of such freedoms is being dropped into the sometimes unwilling and sometimes very willing hands of private companies which use their terms of service to regulate what we can and cannot say. This is happening despite the fact that all major international legal instruments, such as the European Convention of Human Rights, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, the European Charter on Fundamental Rights, all share one key article. All of them say that restrictions on freedom of communication must be based on law. The source of the, this erosion of the rule of law is, ironically, the corporate lawyer. Look at the terms of service of most online offerings and you'll see that companies give themselves almost unlimited powers. Of course, in reality, many of the powers listed in terms of service are actually illegal under contract law. Often it's just a bluff. The customers won't know their rights, and even if the customer does know their rights, they'll find it easier to leave or self-censor or just use another service. So from the online services perspective, it's a risk-free proposition, or at least, that they think so, at least they think that it is. And that's how we end up with terms of service that are vague to the point of comedy. That's how we end up with private censorship that's not based on European laws or not based on any laws or on European morals. Instead, we find ourselves regulated by the political and the public relations priorities of American companies. This is how the New Yorker magazine found its Facebook page blocked by Facebook. The nipple-averse Facebook corporation bans nipples. Not all nipples, female nipples. Male nipples, you'll be delighted to hear, are perfectly fine. The corporation that wants to make the world more open bans female nipples. And female, women's anatomy being, are, is a confusing horror for American private censors. America, Apple was prepared to sell Naomi, Book, Naomi Wolf's book, Vagina, 
but its automatic, automatic censorship tool wouldn't allow Apple to actually mention the name, replacing all but the first and last letters with stars. F star 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 king, W star 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 curves. Companies appear to think that this is a zero risk strategy. They just want to give themselves the maximum room to act in whatever arbitrary way they want. They claim freedom of contract. They claim competition will solve any problems. They think it's all benefit and no risk. The problem is that it's not all benefit and no risk. When companies give, them give themselves the right to act as lawless censors, even if they've got no intention to use these rights, it is perfectly reasonable to assume that they think that such actions are legal, acceptable, and justifiable. But if they can give themselves those powers, surely it's not unreasonable, for the common good, of course, for policymakers to ask them to use those powers for other purposes. A few years ago, the European Commission was reforming its telecoms legislation and the commissioner wanted to implement increased uh, copyright enforcement in the context of this, these new laws. But they didn't know how to actually go about it. And I talked to the, the policymakers involved, and they told me that they had a meeting, and one of them had a bright idea. Let's look at the terms of service of Belgian internet providers and see what they allow themselves to do. And the Belgian Internet Service Providers Terms of Service said that they allowed themselves to disconnect anybody if they felt that anybody was breaking the law. So the European Commission said, well, if they think it's okay to disconnect people on the basis of a suspicion, surely it's perfectly reasonable to include this in European law. The, the Belgian ISPs were horrified, of course, and uh, oppose this. But how can you say that it's unacceptable when you've already said that it's acceptable? Of course, it's not one-way traffic. There is some resistance. On Tuesday 11th of December, the European Parliament passed a non-binding resolution which included a statement of fact, namely that there is a global consensus reflected in the international law that restrictions on fundamental rights must be foreseen by law. But why did they state the obvious? And the reason they stated the obvious, in my view, is fear. Because they see that this statement, that this, glowing, uh, this global consensus is now crumbling. And it's crumbling without debate, without strategy, and without vision. Something that was previously an established part of decades-old international law is now disappearing without this being discussed in a parliament, either a European parliament or a national parliament. It is now acceptable for freedom of communication to be undermined by private companies. And sometimes the abandonment of this principle is breathtakingly blatant. Last year, a pilot project was launched in the Netherlands where every upload to a particular Dutch social media website was filtered to search for child abuse material. The outcome was that not one single image was identified in the filter, and the project was a waste of time and resources. The problem was that it wasn't just a waste of time and resources. It was a step towards normalizing and legitimizing the concept that every single online communication should be, should be subject to automatic prior checking by a technological sensor. Today it's child abuse, tomorrow it's terrorism, and of course, ultimately, it's always about copyright. The European Commission is already funding a permission-based technology to track all online content. The Dutch upload filter system was set up at the initiative of the Dutch police. And this seems quite strange because this upload filtering is obviously a restriction on freedom of communication. And this was quite clearly stated in the um, European Court of Justice Scarlett Saban case. So how could something that was clearly a breach of the law possible? 
The Ed one of Edry's Dutch members, Bits of Freedom, filed a Freedom of, freedom of Information request to find out the, the legal, legal logic behind the project. And the response that they got from the Dutch police said, and I quote, the government is not allowed to limit the use of the internet. Therefore, for stopping uploads, cooperation between the police and private parties is necessary. That needs to be thought about a little bit. On the basis of that analysis of the Dutch police, a government can't impose restrictions on freedom of communication, but a private company can. A government or a police force can circumvent the law in the interests of protect, upholding the law, of course, if it can find ways of encouraging, persuading, or coercing private companies to implement the restrictions that it either cannot or will not implement using democratic law-based processes. Governments can't, private companies can. Excuse me a moment. And coincidentally or otherwise, one can now identify a growing number of measures that ultimately establish this approach as a norm in customary international law, and creating a new approach to the way freedom of communication is regulated. In recent years, we have seen both ACTA and the OECD Communique on Internet Intermediaries both promote voluntary enforcement by private companies. Both include the previously unknown concept of fair process. Fair process is a clever bastardization of the terms fair trial and due process, which actually means nothing other than a clear decision not to support either a fair, fair trial or due process. We simply have a request asking private companies to be fair and what private company would ever believe that it was acting unfairly. This lawless approach is strongly supported by the European Commission, as shown by its support for ACTA, and its funding for a wide range of privatized enforcement measures, such as the infamous Clean IT. You do have to wonder why the European Commission is quite so enthusiastic about privatized enforcement, though. Where is the strategic advantage for the European Union particularly in an international context. Article 27.1 of ACTA would have placed an obligation on parties to encourage enforcement by the business community. What would Europe gain out of an international agreement which would require the United States to encourage further privatization of enforcement of copyright law, for example? Section 104 of SOPA is an example of the type of enforcement by the business community that the US would have been obliged to support under ACTA. Not that they need much obligation to support such things. SOPA provided giving unlimited immunity to internet access providers, hosting providers, domain name registries, domain name registrars, search engines, and payment providers. The leading examples of which are all American for taking punitive actions against foreign online resources if there was a reasonable belief that US interests were being harmed. It's interesting to note that in SOPA, there was no mention of, either, of any law, US law or foreign law, being broken, just a reasonable belief that theft of US property was taking place. That would not just extend US law to European online resources, it would also privatize the enforcement of that law in the hands of US companies, companies that have their own competitive concerns and public relations concerns. It proposed giving them power, and it proposed, proposed removing their responsibility. Power without responsibility is never a good thing. However, from a US perspective, if the power was only ever going to be used outside the US, the risks were clearly limited. So the strategic value for the US was quite clear. The strategic value for the European Union, however, is far less clear. I've tried very hard to find an explanation other than gross incompetence to explain the support for, of the European Union for such a strategically idiotic approach to online regulation, but so far I've failed. If anyone has got any better suggestions, 
our email address is on our website. But maybe I'm being paranoid. Maybe American companies wouldn't vol voluntarily to decide to take punitive measures against people or organizations without any moral or legal basis. Unfortunately, the WikiLeaks case suggests otherwise. After seeing WikiLeaks being accused of being terrorists by the US Vice President, MasterCard, Visa, PayPal, and Amazon all withdrew their services to WikiLeaks. Not because WikiLeaks had break, broken the law, because this hadn't been proven, not because they'd been charged with illegal acts, because WikiLeaks was never charged with illegal acts. The reason was public relations, and the tool was the terms of service of each of the companies. If you look on the Amazon website, you will find their justification. They explain that in their hosting service, there is a ban on uploading dangerous material. And Amazon decided that WikiLeaks material was dangerous. From a public relations perspective, yes, WikiLeaks was dangerous. From any other perspective, probably not. And this is where our normal concept of the rule of law breaks down, and it's replaced by arbitrariness and the whims of individual companies. Governments actively encourage biz businesses to seek legal certainty in terms of service that give legal uncertainty to their customers. Indeed, the draft recommendations of the EU Clean IT project actually promoted the use of vague terms of service to make it easy to act arbitrarily against online speech. Maybe one place one might be able to hope to get best practice in this area is the Global Network Initiative. Set up by Google and Microsoft, its aim was to provide guidance to international companies with help to navigate the complexities and obligations by providing them with clear expert guidance, shared learning, and policy engagement while ensuring accountability and transparency in the interests of global citizens. Surely the companies involved in the GNI must be providing best practice. So let's look at Microsoft as a leading light in this initiative. It includes the following provisions in its terms of service. Microsoft reserves the right at all times to disclose any information as long as Microsoft, as Microsoft deems necessary to satisfy any applicable law, regulation, legal process, or government request, or to edit, refuse to post, or remove any information or materials, in whole or in part, in Microsoft's sole discretion. So, you are simultaneously subject to any applicable law and Microsoft's sole discretion. Could they possibly give themselves any more power to act in an arbitrary way? Yes. It appears that some physicists have now started working in Microsoft's legal department. Their app developer agreement now includes a provision that Microsoft may remove or suspend the availability of any app from the Windows Store for any reason or for no reason. So we now have terms of service wandering into the realm of quantum physics. Microsoft does things for no reason. So the citizen is left with no option other than to self-censor. They need to work out what is likely to respect the law in their own jurisdiction, the law in any other jurisdiction, Microsoft's interpretation of those laws, and Microsoft's interpretation of their own terms of service. And the any reason or no reason wording not only appears in 68 different places on Microsoft's own website, but in literally millions of other services. And Microsoft's terms of service get even more ridiculous. For example, did you know that when you upload pictures to, to your SkyDrive service or store emails on Hotmail, they're scanned repeatedly, not just for illegal content, but also for legal content that Microsoft's lawyers or their politically sensitive executives believe are or might be, by the wildest stretch of imagination, worth banning now or at some stage in the future. 
Microsoft's terms of service ban quotes pictures that depict nudity of any sort, including full or partial human nudity or nudity in non-human forms, such as cartoons, fantasy art, or manga. Read literally, and what other way can you read a legal document? Only a photograph of somebody carry, covered head to foot in a veil and wearing sunglasses would be acceptable. So if you're Taliban with a taste for Ray-Ban, you're probably safe. Otherwise, you just don't know. And it gets worse. The terms of service manage to out extremist the extremists. The full or partial nudity ban, if you remember 15 seconds ago, also covers representation of animals. This would mean that any photograph, any picture that represented that pornographic beast, that trou trouserless abhorrent image that has destroyed the minds of many young people throughout the ages, pictures of Donald Duck would clearly also be banned by Microsoft's terms of service. What is a more blatant breach of the full or partial nudity ban than a duck that has for decades polluted children's minds as he's wandered through life wearing no trousers and just a waistcoat? And the situation becomes even more surreal when we consider that the US Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, according to the US authorities, can make it a criminal act in unclear circumstances to breach terms of service. Donald Duck, the criminal. I advise you to go to the EFF website to find out more about that particular law. But we shouldn't forget Google, which explicitly and publicly implements the United States Digital Millennium Copyright Act, DMCA, globally. Any material banned in one country is moved from Google searches only in that country. The only exception to this is not Nazi content, it's not child abuse material, but alleged copyright infringements. They may send you a notice in English telling you that your contact, content is no longer findable and which US court to complain to. And I've just heard, and our um, friend from Facebook can correct me, that a DMCA request, a complaint to Facebook will lead to the su suspension of your right to upload to your page for a month. My suggestion was to ban yourself from uploading to Facebook for the rest of your life. <laughs> Coming back to international law, though, a recent report from the United States, United, sorry, excuse me, the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime shows how extreme the abandonment of the rule of law has become. This United Nations body called for, quotes, informal relationships or understandings with ISPs, both domestic and foreign, that might hold relevant data for law enforcement purposes about procedures for making such data available for law enforcement investigations. In other words, this United Nations body was asking for arbitrary restrictions on privacy and freedom of communication outside the rule of law. This would be unwelcome and unpleasant at the best of times, but in this case, it's a United Nations body that it is asking United Nations member states to breach the United Nations' own international covenant on civil and political rights, which outlaws exactly such arbitrary or unlawful interference with privacy, home, and correspondence. At a recent meeting at the European Commission, another UN body suggested drawing up a guide for best practice when deleting online content on the basis of accusations or government requests that were not based on the rule of law. This is the UN undermining not just international law, but international law promulgated and implemented by the United Nations itself. And so, somehow or other, we find ourselves in a situation where internet companies are strangling free, free speech on the internet, where nation states are circumventing their own constitutional safeguards on free speech, due process, presumption of innocence, and freedom of communications. And most bizarrely of all, we have the United Nations exhorting the nations of the world to break decades-old international law. 
to uphold the law, of course, not for any bad reasons. Thank you. Two minutes for questions? All right. If anybody's got any points or questions? Yep. Hello. You talked about ACTA and PIPA and SOPA. Um, there's support for a free trade agreement between Europe and the US now called um, TTIP. Uh, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Should we expect more uh, privatization of copyright law enforcement? Um, in a word, yes. Um, if you follow the gun control discussions in the US, you get the impression that it's impossible to pass laws on anything in the US. So the alternative is regulation outside the rule of law. And the European Union seems to be prepared to accept anything. I just now received um, an invitation that was sent to parliamentarians um, for an event hosted by a, um, a German conservative called Daniel Kaspari, who's uh, CDU CSU. And um, the organization is called Friends of TTIP. So th there's a blank sheet of paper. We don't know what's going to be put on it yet, but we have European politicians saying, whatever it is, we love it, which is a bit worrying. But yeah, more of the same as planned. Yeah, very simple question. Where can we find more information about everything you talked about? Um, on, from the European side, um, our website, um, edry.org, um, Netpolitik carries a lot of information on things that are happening in Brussels as well. And uh, for the developments in the US, the EFF, EFF.org website is, is very good. So edry.org, Diggy Guess, uh, whose URL I can't remember, and EFF. Okay.